All right, folks, I want to welcome my guest tonight. It is Todd from New York. Welcome to the show, man. Can you hear me all right? I got you now. All right. Yes. I am excellent. How about yourself, Brian? I'm doing fantastic, man. So I know you've got tons of stories to tell us tonight. So let's just get right into it. Why don't you just take us back to where you were, what happened to you, and take us back to where you were, what you were doing, and what happened to you, man. All right. Well, you know, just to kind of uh, just to, to abbreviate it, uh, I was looking for more hunting land. There's, there's great hunting, great deer habitat, good quality deer in New York, especially up closer to Lake Ontario, where I'm actually located outside Rochester and apple country, but it's access to land. Everything's posted. So I was looking for more acreage for my, my, my son and uh, his buddy, which is like a son of mine too, um, to hunt. And uh, we, we enjoy our bow hunting, but we enjoy, you know, four wheeling and, I'm, I'm a, we're actually all kind of history nuts uh, and we enjoy, you know, running the ATVs. And so in my searching for property, uh, checking with timber companies with leases uh, and had permission for them, I would put the four wheeler in the back of the truck and I could scout and I could scout land fast. And, and instantly at the same time as when uh, Les Stroud um, we used to love watching Survivor Man was on there with Todd Standing talking about the tree structures and I thought that was interesting and I live in a heavy snowfall area and I'm a guy that's in the woods summer, winter, you know I was a snowmobiler, uh, cross country skier and so you know it's like geez, you know we get a lot of the snow and I've seen crazy stuff with snow but I've never seen this stuff before so I just started noticing that in areas that made sense um, and then we started sort of doing some pseudo investigations had a lot of uh interesting encounters but nothing that really convinced us and then i found this lease on craigslist south of uh it's near wellsville new york and it's it's a chunk of land and i took a ride down there and yeah, there, there's a lot of deer on this property, but uh, one thing that was kind of, I thought was interesting, and even today, the deer management units, even this last year, it was preferred points property owners only to get permits. But however, on this farm, the deer are crazy, the density. Um, and it's kind of funny, my son Mason made a comment, says, geez, dad, aren't you glad we're not seeing any sign of Bigfoot on this property? It's like, yeah, I am. Well, <laughs> just because of the rough terrain or some areas that we didn't go into you know really wanted to hunt off the edge of this but you know how it is your arrow a deer they always go downhill and we just didn't need that trouble there's lots of other area to hunt so should have known the very first night when we got there set up the toy hauler paid a hefty price for this property but it, it had everything we were looking for and just paid the farmer real nice guy and uh my son's gotten a fire going and we're cooking, going to cook some venison burgers, on, you know, over a wood fire. And we're like, Hey, you want to, you want to stay and have a burger with us? And he goes, Oh no, it's, it's getting dark. I'm out of here. And I'm immediately like, what? Just, just from the way he acted, uh, you know, how you read people and lots of times uh, that's the only communication that we really have. And it was by his manner and the way this, this, this big old tough, I don't know, 60 year old farmer, no nonsense. He was serious about leaving there. I'm literally at the door of, of his truck, rustling back and forth. He's trying to close it. I'm trying to open it. It's like, I'm out of here. And, you know, at dark, why, why? And finally, I got out of them because, you know, I got these, my responsibility, my boys. And I'm thinking, what is there? Moonshine, marijuana grow, meth lab? What, what's the problem here? And he's like, ah, the place just spooks me out and I'm out of here dark. Well, why? It's like, oh, the funny lights, weird noises. The place creeps me out. And he won the wrestling. He caught me off guard and he got that door out of me. I slammed it. Truck was already running and boom, he was out of there. Well, it was, you know, not too much later that we figured it out. And there's this uh, steep valley. And the three of us are spread out along the valley. And I did decide to hunt the valley that time because I had the two boys with me that if we did have a deer go in there, we got the manpower power to, to burn, you know, to retrieve it. And it was mid-October. It was the first snowfall. So it's a 
we're having some uh, good snow squalls that would be windy, then the wind would lay right back down and be windy. So anyways, uh, just to speed things up, we went through the series of uh, the imitation of the owls. It was prior, uh, it, it, it was too early for the owls. I mean, yes, it was afternoon, but it was way too early. Then it was the rock clacking that really got me. And sizable cobble, you know, like grapefruit sides smacking each other. And it, and it would do it when the wind stopped and then there would be a reply. But uh, meanwhile, uh, Devin Mason and I were texting each other back and forth. Are you hearing this? Are you hearing that? So each of us are hearing some of the same things. But each of us are hearing something that's individual for the, for the three of us. And um, yeah, it proceeded. Uh, they mimicked uh, everything. The owls was really uh, impressive, like 600 owls. And then the owls became very complacent. And then they got very bored where they're ultimately like, who? who I, and we're kind of laughing at each other well what i didn't know what was going on to devon and mason were different things especially devon uh devon was actually turkey hunting and he was turkey calling he actually had one that kind of came up behind the ridge to him and peered over to him thinking it was perhaps sneaking up on a turkey just as uh devon was trying to be good and not move a lot and trying to look with his eyes as far as he could so he just got a flash of something that is definitely vertical, the Auburn color, freaked him out. He, he left and, and I'm, this actually, this was quite an encounter. It's, it's, it's frankly a whole nother episode within itself. I really want to kind of flash forward everything, but uh, at the end of the day, what we observed, I, 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 you know, just speculate really the three of us from what we observed was, it was an organized deer drive and we interrupted this deer drive in particular where i was sitting was where they would close the deer drive i mean brian were you a hunter and uh so you know you kind of have some blockers but you have the closers at the end and i i enjoy uh being a history nut uh you know archaeology anthropology by no means an expert of anything um I love studying uh Iroquois Indians, and they're looking for artifacts. I find them all the time. Well, anyways, I always think in the terms of uh, if I only had, you know, sticks and stones, essentially, to hunt deer with, you can. And and you can exhaust them. They're, they're burst animals. They're not a long-distance animal. And you can take that advantage if you're cognitive of your emotions and what you do and kind of work a force multiplier. But anyways... There's a small ravine that which starts and dumps into that other ravine that uh, for reasons I determined it was the kill box. Um, and to, to come to find out later, I didn't know how right I was because uh, last year I went down there specifically to search that barbed wire fence for hair because I I know that that's where they're closing the deer drives. I've witnessed that. But one night I spotlighted that field as soon as I pulled in. It's like 300 yards. And ironically, I put the, the beam straight on. Uh, you know, honestly, what it looked like at first was we were like, how is that four-wheeler up in the tree? It looked like the two small taillights to break on at night of an ATV. But it's up in the tree. And I had the spotlight on it for a minute. And it, it was, you know kind of widespread and then I, I rotated my wrist a little bit to see it was on next to it put it back on it was gone well this is the exact same spot where I was so anyways uh you know last year this is all I've continued to research but I really poured into it more this this last year down there given I have more time now and uh I went to this location because I believe that they cross there to watch the farmer to see if it's safe to start the hunt also to uh, it's a century location but it's also where they do the clothes and i wanted to go down there and look for hair on this fence and oh yeah i've been pulling hair consistently off of it um you know this is a real nice one i don't know how well you can see it but i'll tell you it has a flesh tag on it and this one i i I theorized was stepping over the fence and it, it pulled that hair off kind of between its legs. Frankly, it looked like it hurt. And I'll tell you, there was also snow there. And when you have this fresh lake, lake effect snow, it's real big fluffy flakes. So you really 
don't leave a footprint. It's like kind of kicking through feathers. You get to see where something bipedal came up to the fence and came over to the other side because the, the you know there's tracks immediately on, just like you would leave if you were crossing a 50 inch fence and you're really tall. And I continue to pull black hair. Uh, there's uh, a blondish one, your typical kind of auburn. There's some that actually pull the fence apart to go through. Um, so in speaking to the farmer, um, he, he at one point had told me that he started up there with 185 sheep in less than a year. He was down to like five or six. I, I don't remember what he said. It was five or six. But he would lose them at swaths of 20 to 30 at a time. And this fellow has always said these couple of things that are interesting. He's in denial that the creatures are there. He says the, this farm hilltop is fine, except for all the coyotes and the damn ghost. So we, you know, I, I, I'm not saying those things aren't there either, but, um, you know, coyotes just don't do that. I'm not saying I'm an expert predator hunter, uh, but I, I have knowledge, you know what I mean? And well, this, this spot with that little kill box is, well, that's where he had 20 or 30 of them. They literally were piled up in there. Um, and he couldn't really, and I need to pin him down more and I'm gonna, he's reluctant to talk about it. And I'm very lucky that he lets me do this there. Uh, cause he's, he's, he won't admit he's scared, but he's clearly scared and he should. Um, and actually anything that I do there is always in protection of him, be it from people, researchers, somebody, even myself accidentally doing something that might. Uh, jeopardize him later you know I, I tread real lightly there um so i think that uh, these these creatures uh i i have multiple reasons uh, from experience and observation of them and i'm not saying that i've been able to watch them have this organized hunt but you can hear them and you know the net results and i know if i was going to do a deer drive this is the way i would do it and I'll tell you, this farm is something else. And all I can say is uh, I've been digging into why is this place so special? Uh, this, this, I believe that this place is a, um, a core area. And, and so you have to forgive me on some terms because uh, I, I know him as, uh, as a hunter and, and how I think and process and such. And so it, it's a core area that offers them benefits, advantages. Uh, I think that there's, um, it, they're, they're the geography, uh, the habitat, and uh, other extrinsic conditions that just uh, like a perfect storm beneficial to them. And I believe that they're in this location more frequently than other areas. Does that make sense to what I'm describing? It does. I've talked to many people that have sort of had the same type of feeling that these things weren't necessarily migratory, but they hung out in certain areas at certain times. And it's been, I can't remember who made the reference the other day that I was talking to, but it's almost like the grocery store. That's what the grocery store has at the time. That's what they're looking for. So that's where they're at to get yep. need as far as the groceries are concerned. Yep. Uh, that's excellent. And I, and I agree with that. And this, uh, so some of the differences is the, is the geography and that this farm is used, but nobody lives up there. And it's, it's approximately a two mile long private driveway. It, you know, it used to be an actual road that went through and when there was more people around before the depression um, and it's isolated and it has geographical advantages that I found in common with other areas. And of course, there's water. There's plenty of water in New York. Actually, speaking of which, yesterday I was doing a little bit, uh, you know, under my definition would be research is um, whether this creek had trout in it. And the DEC, D Department of Environmental Con Con Conservation, does, I think it's every two or three years. I don't want to say it was every two years, they do the survey where they go in and they electroshock them or whatever they do, they stun them. And it is one of the rare locations of wild native brook trout, apparently in New York. But uh, what they you know, described in this article quite a bit though is 
it's it's a sleeper location due to the inability to access it because of private property and the geography. So they stated where the test location is, and I know precisely where that is. And then they had stated in there, uh, then they tested a, you know, their other control was a half mile up uh, stream. So I get up Google Earth measure. I use Google Math Maps like crazy. And isn't that right over the other side of the valley? Uh, I mean, it, it's straight down from where I have all these encounters and everything happening. It's right there. So the other major factor is with this farm being unoccupied. Um, so your typical uh, Appalachian mountains up here, the foothills, the glaciers took the tops off them. So it's all these huge uh, valleys and ravines and such from erosion, but the mountaintops are gone. So there's a lot of agriculture up on the hilltops, but the cover is on the sides. Um, so this place is not too different than that, but it, it's a little more isolated than, than other places. So it's, it's controlled and, and they have definitely a handle and a system of monitoring you coming in and then relaying that information to the other creatures. So, it, it, and, and also give them what the farmer said, he's out of there at night. They, they, they own the night up there and they allow you to be there during the day. But uh, what it is, is there's, there's the grazing and the crops up there. So he's not a sheep farmer anymore. He has black Angus cattle now. I, I don't know how many, uh, over a hundred. I mean, it's not a ginormous operation, but it's, it's enough to keep a guy busy. And uh, being that it only comes up there every other day, you know, check on him. Uh, there's all these round bats that he has inventoried for the winter up there. And those deer hammer those round bells that I, I can pull in up there by the machine shed, park, knock it out of my truck. And I'll literally deer will like scamper off like, like um, habituated deer, even though they aren't. Uh, and remember I was saying before, there isn't the deer population there. They didn't, they don't give out the dope permits, but they yard up on this farm because the food and the cover's there and it's these round bells that they hammer. I mean, they pull the ends of the round bells out. I mean, this fellow is feeding a herd of deer. Uh, when we be there bow hunting, my, my son kept missing. Uh, apparently his sight or something got knocked and he kept shooting at these does, ran out of arrows and he climbed down and there was just still so many deer around. He was feeding them cookies. You know, he wasn't hand feeding, but taught uh, close enough. And we would come out our, 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 our camper door and the, the deer would be right there looking at us with a mouthful of hay because there isn't enough for them to eat. And, and what's interesting to me is they were still there this spring and this summer. And I've had activity in other, uh, not evidence, the, the word I'm looking for, it's, um, you know, that I speculate that they were in at the time. It's been year round. The only time I've been there is in March. Um, or that I find something, you know, of a recent activity that indicates that. And again, it comes all the way back to the deer. And now I know about the fish, which is, I think, really stunning. Um, so this is all the headwaters. And this is the history part I love. It's the headwaters of the Genesee River. Genesee River flows into Lake Ontario and that goes out to St. Lawrence into the ocean. Well, where that, where that river starts, the same hilltop mountain is where the Allegheny River starts. And the Allegheny goes into the Ohio and it goes into the Mississippi. And then I just learned that's where I think it's uh, Pine Creek starts, and which goes into Susquehanna and goes out to Chesapeake. So it's a tri-continental tri watershed. And then and if you know your, your Indians projection of power and the ability to communicate, this is what made the Seneca so great because that it was the hub of the highway. And I also speculate that's why they were called the keepers of the Western gate, that this area is the Western gate. Anyhow, um, so flash forward all this cool stuff. Um, Memorial Day last year, I was down there, took the camper, parked on this curve, 
Uh, and the reason I would go to this curve because it just it kind of had a unique listening uh, opportunities because one thing I've observed many times in many different areas is that Ohio howl or siren call, I, I call it personally, I call it the check it because other than one time, I, I don't believe that I've ever heard it other than just prior sunset at sunset or just after sunset. And there's been other responses and it just leads me to, you know, I could be completely wrong, but I just, you know, theorize that it's uh, Hey y'all, you know, oh, I'm up for my nap. Hey, let's go get some dinner together. Where you at? I'm over here. Or, or maybe it's the alpha saying, okay, this is where I'm at. This is where we're going to hunt today. Y'all need to come to me because I've heard, responses from other areas uh, and i have some recordings of it but i'll tell you it's the recordings is my next area that i want help i'll spend the money on the zoom that's uh, or the better recorders that's not the issue the issue is i need help going through all this evidence you know i i have the tools i have the place i have the equipment i, I just bought a on a 1000 side by side. Now it's only the three cab, but it's enclosed. I got heat. I got all sorts of lights on it that, you know, I, I, I put the, the, the red, red uh, uh, mylar tape over it. So we can, we can operate under red, but the advantage that gives it me is uh, it, uh, it's less intrusive to the, to any kind of wildlife. Cause I love seeing wildlife. Of course, uh, on my, my list of to see there is this black, mountain line that everybody talks about and the, and the property owner there has had several encounters and one of them's quite close I, I won't tell the story but it's a pretty funny story um so and I and I, and I believe them. I haven't seen them I've I've seen the prints in the snow a trackway uh not at this location a different research location but historically people have been seeing it so anyhow I can run along with the uh with that side by side with the comfort because I'm, I'm getting older and like i said i've my injuries are catching up with me fast i got, I got 32 different screws pins plates rods um they're cut they're catching up to me so then i just picked up my uh let's see this this i'm showing for brian is this this remote controlled spotlight that I can put on top of that, turn it and everything. But what I'm trying to, I haven't connected it, but that's the C Compact Pro thermal that I'll hook to the phone and the pad. But I'm trying to build a little protect, a uh, little weather protection there. And of course I covered that with that red Mylar too. So as I can pick up the eye shine without spooking the animals uh, and it'll probably spook Bigfoot creatures a little bit, but uh, maybe it'll help me because, you know, you can't look with that flare everywhere at the same time. So it just kind of helped. Hey, saw I shine over there. And so, you know, I got spotlights on the front backs, everything covered in red. And then, of course, I got my obvious road lights because this area is just covered with, uh, you know, dirt roads, logging roads, gas lines everywhere. And, you know, run those. So I got my seek up there i haven't been out with that yet um so anyways uh it, I, and i know it's trying to keep this an hour so i'm sorry that i'm fast because i do have a lot to talk about some stuff that's exciting to me um is i really i really like learning seeing witnessing studying learning more um because I'll tell you, I'm 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 a student of Bigfoot. I'm I'm in school, and and actually, as a long time experienced hunter, I'm always being schooled. And that's actually why I, I like it. I like learning because maybe if you master it, you get bored. Um, behavior. I I really like the behavior, and 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 how is it that you know these guys earn a living out there, and how they survive day to day? But more than that, I'm I'm learning how they. Most wildlife's a creature of the edge, but I mean, they really live on the edge and they're a lot closer to us than what we think and know. And I had that experience last year that they were so much closer and um, it's a little scary, you know? Uh, they're like, 
SEAL Team 6 Ninja Warriors that uh, can beam up anytime. I, I don't know. I'm just exaggerating. It. Um, so let's fast forward. We, we we went through the stuff that happened in 2015. And so when you yeah. got up to this experience this past year, tell us what, what you were doing and what happened during this experience that was so profound for you. So we had um, set up my toy hauler, you know, and I, I got that one just for those kind of like the command post. Uh, but I'm not going to say it in that. That's a hokey term, but... <sighs> I like to listen from there, but um, I can we consistently see those damn balls of light from this location. So I wanted to be able to see that. It was just a good spot. Uh, so that night we were out, and what's strange with these balls of light is, you know, from this curved vantage point, it's about 300 yards where they consistently appear on this hill with some pretty consistency. But yeah, if I get down closer, like within a hundred yards, I, the equipment doesn't work or they don't ever display or anything. So, you know, being May, the foliage is out. So from this position, I, I, can, I can see the lights a little bit, but I can't videotape them. And you only get little glimpses through the footage, foliage. So we were down there, of course, it didn't work, trying to be closer, they don't show themselves. So it's about midnight, it's cold. We're in the camper warming up, sitting at the dinette. And a friend of mine was along. He's, he's a videographer and he's interested in this stuff. And I just threw the invite out. It's like, hey, Derek, you want to come along? So, you know, he ended up uh, having a camera and had a, had a mic on me. And he just said, just, uh, you know, just tell me what you're doing. So that, that's all I ever did. There. There is two episodes to this. I've bought the rights of it. I don't know what to do with it for reasons because it's not what I was trying to portray and portray. I didn't do the editing. I'm in a conundrum of what to do with it. So I kind of keep it hidden from the Bigfoot world. And then the other thing that frustrates me, there was a, of course, you have the Bigfoot curse, uh, this perch that I had found uh, and a couple other cool things, a trackway got edited out and they can't find it. You know, or got edited out, but he says that the, the, it's just, it's not there, which is weird. Anyways, we're sitting there talking, warming up, we're chatting. Yeah. And you, everybody's from over the inside of the camper. We're sitting at the dinette and, and uh, Devin, I'm going to call him Devin. He's sitting on the couch next to me. He's grown up with me. Now, Devin's just uh, recently out of the Marines, and he has a very sensitive job. Um, uh, making some sensitive military equipment. And he works with some very serious people uh, doing some very serious things. And I, I just I have to be really careful what I say. And I've actually bought this because I think it could possibly jeopardize his security clearance, his career. Um, but anyways, just knowing who Devin is, he's not rattled, you know, and now he's what, 24, 25 at this time, he's 250 pounds. I mean, you'll look at him, he just breathes ex-Marine. And we're talking away and look over at Devin, his eyes are like saucers. And I've seen him like that only one time before. And that's when Devin had the Bigfoot sighting. And I see him looking at that and it's taken me a minute and, and Derek's looking at him too. It's taken us a minute to process reading the body language, you know, that something's not right. Then I see his hands cover his groin, which is a very reptilian brain primal thing to do. And then, then he started shrinking. Then he literally fell over in the seat. And the only thing he didn't do was like pull the blanket up over his head and start sucking his thumb or something. I mean, it, and it clicked with uh, Derek and I that he sees something because he looks like he's looking at us. He's not. He's looking between the two of us. He's looking out the window over my right shoulder a foot away. And Derek was able to turn so much faster than me. And he screams and jumps up out of the seat because he saw something move like short of face to face with him. But he so fast he couldn't register, but he saw the motion. And and I'm I turned and and being that you know, I'm got my injuries. I don't move real fast. 
and I, I don't see anything. And I'm looking back at the two of those. And, and, and now Devin's, I want to go home. I want to go home now. I want to go home. I want to go home now. This isn't fun. And it, I'm like, holy shit. What? Excuse my language. Uh, didn't know. So long and short, the old broken guy. Uh, I guess because I don't have that fear gene working properly in me. Yeah, I went out looking. And uh, I give Derek a lot of credit because, you know what, he was recording behind me. So, hey, you know, as I'm out there, I'm, uh, you would understand this being a police officer. And I have some former life experience that forced me to uh, just develop these street smart skills and staying alive and just being uh, this hyper situational awareness. So I already know that I'm a deficit from my injury because I've lost some peripheral vision and my hearing is awful, also uh, skewed. So in other words, if it's off my right shoulder immediately, it, I don't know exactly where it comes from uh, precisely. I mean, I have the hearing, but anyways, so uh, that point being, I had my FLIR, but I'll tell you what, I did not take my glasses off and I'm looking through my left eye because I'm right eye dominant and, and I'm refusing to let any kind of light sacrifice if if i was forced to defend myself in a close quarter situation you know and 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 this is all just happening instinctively and you could just cut you cut it with a knife this atmosphere so i'm scanning with the therm thermal and the you know the 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 ground falls off around me in this direction and there's goldenrod and it turns into the forest and i'm getting this heat signature and gosh, to me, it kind of looks like these two horizontal features, like if somebody, uh, Marie Recon, was, you know, or somebody playing hide and seek that you know, was moving through the cover of the tall goldenrod, uh, you know, sneaking up on you uh, less than 20 yards away from me. But, and, but I don't have this flare tied up to my eye. And yes, I want to hit record. And I thought about that too. But I'm not really feeling the functions because it's like 40 degrees out and it's raining and cold. So I don't have super sensitivity to feeling the button. And I just, I refuse to draw any of my focus away from my entire environment. What might be going on at this moment? Uh, and I, you know, it's funny how we automatically debunk things and dismiss them. And when we look back at it later, it's like, holy shit, you know, I'm out there Bigfoot and I refuse to accept that I'm seen as a Bigfoot. No, it can't be. Uh, it's like, no, those are two logs. They're decaying because a little bit warm temperature in the rain today, the therm is picking up the temperature difference. And I don't know that there is or is not rotting logs over there, but that's immediately where I was going to, you know, and I take the thing down from my eye. I'm talking to Derek and we heard a branch break behind us. And that's where I asked Derek, I go, did you hear that? He goes, yeah. I go, where did it come from? Because I needed to know direction exactly where behind me. And he says where it was. And then I already know this trick really well that they do. Uh, you're looking at this one thing and all of a sudden there's something behind you. Uh, and then you look forward. What's in front of you? They had your original attention is gone. Oh, absolutely. They, they triangulate on you. And that's, that's how they escape from you. And it's super clever, super, I, I absolutely admire it. So I look back and I could swear that those, I was confident in that moment that those two heat signatures are now in a different position because before it looked like they were kind of parallel. Now when I glance back, they're kind of perpendicular to each other a little bit. And now that, and again, I, I don't have time to take a picture and do a side by side. Now I'm really heightened. Uh, what happened next again this is what's disappointing to me about that's not in this documentary we did was this thud people would call it a tree knock i believe that there's tree knocks but i absolutely believe that they can make a noise simulating that and actually when i go uh, a woods i mean uh, a field i um i take a dead blow hammer with me and I'll hit the trees with it because to me that replicates what I hear. It's a lower frequency sound, makes more of a thud. Well, this thud was close. It was like in the front of my truck. So you imagine a, a, a camper with a pickup truck hooked up to it and it's something right in front of that, give you an idea of the distance. 
and there were trees and again that property dropped off this was kind of like uh almost like out on a point and i was purposely trying to offer them that uh castle moat benefit on this one side this other side boy they could be right up on me and one step uh but anyways at that instant was this thud and i could tell the tree was very close but what was stunning to me and i so wish we had it recorded was that birds were roosted in it the birds you could hear them flush you know the flutter and the branches and then and a couple peeps and squawks as they flew off just regular songbirds and i'm not a bird expert but i'm in the orchard and vineyard supply business i do a lot of wildlife control and i've been dealing with deer and birds in that aspect, protecting high value crops. Uh, I've been doing it 30 years. I'm not an expert. I have a lot of experience. And it makes sense that the, the songbirds would roost there. And you got to mind you, again, it, it, it's 12 o'clock. Yes, yeah, Memorial Day weekend, but it's New York State. It's 40 degrees <laughs> and, and, and rain. And it was that distraction method. And, and yep, I knew immediate, immediately I turned back to that spot with that therm. Because I was going to be determined, I was going to snap a picture or hit the video on it. Gone. So I go back in the camper, uh, and of course we we've inspected for prints. Apparently, something walked underneath the awning of the camper, of which I had rolled out uh, uh, heavy duty plastic just to kind of prevent some of the mud and clumping that were coming in. And you know how you walk strictly in one area, you get the hydrofaction where you start mudding and mucking the, the mud up. Um, it should have left prints on that. It didn't. So uh, I'm very methodical when I do stuff. So like when I was walking out there, I'm, I'm light with one and I'm, I'm just, I'm reading my ground. I'm not going to say I'm a tracker, but uh, I am definitely better than the average bear just from years of, hunting and and loving tracking animals and just being a uh, curious so you know and now we're, we're circling the camper looking for more prints uh wasn't comfortable going any further back in the camper checking on devin and what was interesting just prior to leaving there i had handed him a shotgun that was loaded with a light and when i come in the gun is unloaded and sitting away. He grew up hunting on that gun. He knows that gun. Probably almost as good as his M4 or whatever they issue the Marines. Um, he said that he felt compelled. He didn't want it near him, which I, I've only heard that once before from somebody else's encounter. I thought that was really interesting. So Then there's some other events that honestly in this video I I, I would have rather kept private because some of my personal beliefs and, and and life experiences. I'm a Christian man. I am not a perfect man by any freaking means, and I'm a former I'm a reformed uh, paranormal researcher, and I, I emphasize reformed for a reason, and. Uh, so I have my knowledge base of that, which is a benefit, but, uh, um, these things can do, it may be the infrasound and how they can individually affect people. Cause this has happened before with another individual with me highly trained and he was truly a special ops guy and he was six months out of the service and how it affected him. And he was right near me. It had no effect on me, but I don't know if it's because I'm 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 broken or this covering. I, I don't want to get into any of that on this channel. <laughs> um, but I think it could be just simple as that how sound and different things and even light affects our, our fear response with our brain and what it does for self-preservation. And it could simply be that, but, uh, you know, of course I asked Devin what it was that he saw. And of course I'm making up Devin's name. Um, Devin said that, uh, he didn't know what he saw. And I really felt in the moment that, uh, it was protecting his brain, but I found it so interesting because I gotta, I gotta assume that these 
you know, in the, in the service that they prepare these guys for PTSD, as opposed to dealing with it later and turn us, us older guys, I'm not calling you old, but into basket cases later and not knowing why, because, you know, when I did what I used to do, they didn't, we didn't know what PTSD was. We didn't talk about it. You went home, you drank and you cried by yourself, you know? Um, but now today that's different. <laughs> um, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but this puts us in time and place. And to me, that's kind of important. So come morning. And I'm sure I just that event in the camper. I could talk all night about that. But anyways, come morning. Uh, I'm letting, I'm letting Devin sleep in. And I, I know that something visited us. Devin couldn't describe what it was that looked in the window at him. And part of that too is the way that there was, you know, fog and condensation on it. And additionally, the way that the lower screen is that opens on the window, it kind of stops some um, clear vision, but that the outside light that was on within the awning. Uh, and this was producing light. It wasn't like it was something solid. And, and actually, to finish up with that real quick, uh, incidentally, there was kind of a little uh, uh, undulation in the ground right there. Um, we measured that. So for Devin to see the top of the head or whatever this was, was seven and a half feet to see that. So in the morning, Derek and I are, are let Devin sleep in a little bit. And so it's done raining. The sun's out. We're walking this, this dirt road. Now, mind you, this, uh, this dirt road is actually really well maintained. And it's the sweetest, easiest place to Bigfoot from because you can sit right in your truck. You would think I could get people to come with me um, because if it's too hot or what, you know what I mean? It's just, it's, it's, or you're cold typically is the case. Um, so, anyways, it's maintained because there's the gas wall up there and they maintain it, but it's, it is all private, posted, gated um but it's well maintained and so we started walking it looking for tracks this thing's got to leave damn tracks somewhere and i believe that they know that they leave tracks but they make mistakes so as we're walking along this road and we're we're heading south and we're 75 yards from the camper uh, I get to this unique low spot in the road, which is something else that I've, I've really noticed that they, they so take advantage of their terrain, just like turkeys, deer, and coyotes do, any, or, or hunters of men. Any little feature that breaks up your silhouette or any little undulation in the ground, they run that screen. So this spot offers that so that they can cross and drop down in that valley. Well, we're at that location. And so I'm standing there telling Derek about this one video that he'd seen of mine of this ball of light that was behind me because I'd always saw him the north side of the camper. And when I was getting ready to leave one night, I turned around and saw it south of the camper, like behind me. And that really freaked me out of what that I let something, I didn't know something was that close. And I don't even know what these lights were. But this light over there, I've seen a few more times since then. It's a little bit different than the others. It's more of an orangish incandescent uh, and just a, a bright light. And I don't, I haven't gotten a good video of it yet. And each time, even on this video, it's, it's moving through the forest. You know what I mean? So it's being diffused. So you're just seeing light, 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 you know, like it's going on and off. It's not. So anyhow, this is how it got me in this time, moment, and space. As I'm standing there, there's a there's a spring that goes to the west so there's really no trees and it creates a little opening in the forest um but it, it it's only an occasional spring and i don't know if because of the, the close fracking affected why there's not water standing in it right now but anyways i don't want to get into that um i'm pointing down there telling derek well this is where that one light was was right over here i'm telling that story and additionally i'm kind of telling about some of the uh the indian lore that allegedly there was uh, an attack uh, a fight on this property and you know i'm just going over theorizing of how they would move and i'm discussing that to, to derek and derek uh, I, uh, I didn't realize at that point it actually took one or two steps away from me so i'm still looking you know to the to the west there 
I see a limb pop up, just one limb, you know, like three, four foot long limb. Uh, it was a uh, beech nut tree pop up and that caught my attention. You know, you as a hunter, it's like, huh. So, you know, you start that scan of, well, what's the rest of the forest doing? Nothing else is moving. I'm scanning wider and wider. And, and then under some of the lower scaffolding to the left of that position, I see four black legs and feet. And this is, uh, you know, I've measured it with my um, range finder, but I can't, I can't remember what it is. I think it's 30 yards. I may be wrong. I don't think it's over 50 yards. But anyways, it's like, ooh, I'm going to see a bear, you know, and I, I'm excited to see a bear. I'm trying to grab Derek because, you know, he lives in, in the city in Baltimore. He doesn't get to see bears, but I'm not taking my eye off this thing. So I'm like scooping this air of a non-existent uh, person next to me. And at the same time, not taking my eye off of this, I'm also sidestepping, trying to get a hold of Derek to see this bear. But in that process of stepping over there, scooping air and grabbing him, this bear that I think I'm about to see is walking along and I can't see the body yet, but it gets to this little opening, just like this happens to be just like a window into the forest, just coincidentally offering me this view. And it traveled oblique or, or quartering away from me. So in distance of travel, maybe, maybe I saw it travel 60 feet in that quartering away direction. It was not a bear. It was, uh, and now I know where that definition of a no head comes from, from down south. Because when I first saw this thing, I knew it wasn't a bear. And, you know, I think you can identify this as a hunter and, a, and a, somebody that was a former shooter. There, there is just some, some super fast processing that goes through your brain of, you know, uh, identifying your target. Uh, is this an animal I want to harvest? And now quickly, um, is this a safe shot? And then um, my vitals, is there anything in between my vitals? So anyways, I'm not doing that processing, but yet I am you know, just, just, I think I had the benefit in that situation because of my experience, um, that quickly I'm, I'm looking at the shoulders, the shoulders down the spine. And I only could see it to like, you know, be like our waistline back up. There's no head on this thing. I can't believe how wide the shoulders are. Look at the length of the hair on the shoulders. And then I see a four, it's left arm. So I'm seeing like above the wrist, up the shoulder as it's traveling, quartering away to my left. So like, in other words, if I'm six o'clock, it's traveling to the 11 o'clock. Uh, it was in, it was still quadruped, but almost running. Well, all I can say, if somebody lost an adult billy ape outside of wellsville that has some kind of special effects uh football pads on it as well um i saw it i know where it is i mean what i saw was definitely it was it was it was um it was a primate by all the way its actions but i, I kept turning back to it it's like i can't believe how wide the shoulders are on this thing and i knew it was a young one um just because, you know, I could tell my distance and stuff. I mean, um, I was thinking it was something that was five, six feet tall. I think actually, uh, once I did a comparison, I think it was a little bit shorter than that. But this thing scrambled half uh, knuckle walking. Uh, but I'm not saying I saw its knuckles make compact contact. I saw like kind of like wrist up and couldn't believe how long the arms were. So as this thing is like starting to accelerate, you know, out, when it came out of that cover from quadruped, it's basically like bursting into a run and scramble. So this area has uh, been logged off, but it's really selectively logged and well, very well managed. And it's getting back to a lot of these unique features that are there is there isn't any lower scaffold on the trees. These, and it makes great logs, nice, tall, straight nice opening uh but then then the burst of canopy so if you kind of stare and look at it you can see how a juvenile could 
shimmy right up that thing quick, but it doesn't have any of the scaffold for other primates to get an advantage to come up after it. Uh, but when it was logged off, they left some of the treetops there. So as it's crossing over this treetop that's probably been laying there five, six years, some of the branches, and I'm speculating, are maybe like say inch and a half, two inch in diameter. As it was scrambling over that, those broke and I actually saw the thing drop like a foot and I heard them break. But when it like when it was scrambling over it and when it dropped a little bit, it startled the animal. I saw the coolest thing, the hair on its shoulders that like had, I saw the hair stand up and I want to and I was talking to Steve Calls about it. Paleo erection or paleo, paleo erection. I don't know which is uh, correct, but uh, just like the hair stands up on the back of your neck or when your dog is, uh, you know, scared or aggressive, the hair stands on the back of it. I saw the hair stand up on its shoulders, which was mind numbing to me because I was already honestly blown away about the width of the shoulders. And, and back to the no head, I did actually see a head, head as it was scrambling because I'm looking for a head. And in my mind is I'm going down that checklist, the Bigfoot. And I was like, where's the conical head? Where's the head? Well, as it's running along and bobbing, I did see the back of its head a little bit simply. And, it, and it's just like you see all other large chimps or, or apes, you know, as they run to the brush, their, their head is pushed forward of their shoulders. Um, black oh the sheen to it almost had a purple sheen to it and what was uh, the only thing I observed was really neat I mean I could clearly see its spinal column and the hair come out from the spinal column like it was well groomed like uh, like the hair was parted in the middle you know when people used to grease their hair way back then and like it was been groomed but the shoulder tops of the shoulders. And now I know what people say when they say bowling balls, it looks because of all that hair and the muscle, but mostly all the hair it gives that effect of like a, a bowling ball. But yet I saw that hair stand up on end. So of course, you know, when I go home, I, man, I'm, I'm researching more documentaries on TV, the Billy ape and such and son of a gun. When I, when I saw a couple of those apes kind of squaring off to each other, I was able to witness apes able to have their hair on their shoulders stand up. So, you know, as I pulled a Derek in after I'm grabbing air and right when I pulled him in, I almost put the poor guy in a headlock and, and he's a good, strong guy. And, uh, but you know, that adrenaline, I, I had a hold of him and I threw my arm out. So he'd look right down the sight line of it, right when he got in that position, of course, is right when the thing passed out of my any further vision he saw nothing so yeah i saw this thing by myself you know and and i'm grateful to, to have seen it but i almost had a witness with me if it was like three seconds sooner <laughs> um so of course i you know i immediately mark the driveway with my foot of where I am and again that goes just a, a habit of like bow hunting because I know things change when you get out of that tree stand where you think you shot there or whatever I will always immediately make a huge mark in the earth of where I started off and that helps with any kind of trailing or tracking and then I go get uh, Devin and I set him up with uh, basically like uh, some survey tape a survey tape tape and a stake five foot stake and I got a laser and uh, it's a pretty powerful laser. It goes back to the, some of this bird control stuff. Uh, I send Devin into the woods. I'm standing on my mark and I'm painting where I, where this thing was. So he's, he's gone. He went in there and, you know, staked it where I saw it really excited because I was assuming that it was still going to be wet because it's traditionally wet in there. I mean, uh, it, it, it's changed the formation of the ground. It's eroded out of there from erosion. It's, it's starting like this little valley. Um, I'm going to get a good track, but I saw the track maker, you know, and I was really excited for that. And our last May was really, really dry. And there was not a track. 
But, you know, when we get in there, uh, you know, tree structures, I got to admit, I, I think there's, there's something to it. And, and, but then it's going to go right back to that statement of causation. I mean, excuse me, correlation doesn't equal causation, but you know, gosh, you get enough of it after a while, you got to keep it back your mind. So, uh, and again, with this weather thing and the snow, I'm pretty, I think I'm pretty good at identifying it. But there was some stuff in there I thought was in, that had my interesting interest. And no less, it's where I definitely saw a creature. So now we're we're going over to where did I? I'm looking for tracks. Where did this the, its travel route? Where did I first see it at? And I find that location. And this is the other thing that I find so cool. It was again another treetop. It had been logged in there as a treetop. Now these branches sitting horizontally are five six inch diameter it created a perch it could sit up on you know with its butt on one of the logs elevated and have its feet sitting down below and not only that the bark was worn off of it it sits there so frequently it wore the bark off of that tree because you know when you drop a tree top that that top it lives a while you know before it'll start rotting and losing its bark it takes that's quite a while and so obviously during shortly after logging while the thing was still technically alive because you know the leaves are working it's getting water yada yada um it wore the bark off of it, where the butt was and where the seat was. And uh, yeah, I, I hopped up into that thing. And there is a, a that beech nut limb. There's a small one in front of me. I pull the thing down. I look out. There's a straight like tunnel window to my, my ATV. I parked my ATV exactly on that spot I made on the driveway. All I could see there was my ATV. This is clearly something sits here and watches the farmer drive in and out. And it's typically only him and his son. People don't walk this road. I was walking it. Um, so having this juvenile sighting, going back to that night before in the camper, I sit there with like, holy cow, you know, there was something that really happened that night at the camper. I mean, correlation doesn't mean causation, but for, but for God's sakes, I, I saw one 75 yards away. And I'll tell you, Brian, within that, that blows my mind that they felt secure enough with me because uh, I think they do recognize people. And I try to come with the same truck. In fact, uh, the farmer has three, four Cummings. That's what I drive down there. We, they're different color trucks, but I'll tell you, they sound similar. Um, and they're close in years, so I think it's close enough. And it just has kind of become, I'm not going to say accepted, but just kind of known quantity. I, I, I don't know. I, I got to think that uh, with this juvenile that I saw that uh, its mother would have I don't know that that tells me that there were still likely other adults immediately around us. So that's kind of scary in retrospect. So this perch is that's really cool. Uh, you know, to, to finish, there was other things that happened with that day, but what I want to focus on this, this perch area. So I've been back down there a couple of times with that perch and on a mission to collect DNA because there was a couple within this uh, tree fall area there was a couple other spots that I identified that something human size or larger sits its butt on that part and and sits its feet there I don't know maybe I could get a little bit of a scraping off of that maybe for some DNA testing all right and I know which one we sat in and so this is this is in July I don't I don't have to take a testing from that one I can do a different one so I can't get anybody to go with me, you know, life's busy. People are interested, but the reality, you know, is, is tough. Plus it freaks people out a little bit when you tell them too much. <laughs> um, so I go in there and it's been destroyed. 
So this is the, the other seat I was telling you about that I wanted to get. So I, I collected it. I didn't have these bags then. I saw what I was dealing with. It was destroyed. Well, that night I went down to town and I got some sterile garbage bags because uh, I got to get in and out of here quick. I didn't know what else to do. It's probably not the best way to collect DNA, but you know what? If you got a better way, why doesn't somebody come with me that does the DNA and, and collect it with me? I can bring you to the spots, but I want somebody to, I try my best. So this is sat, I think the shelf life has passed on it. But anyways, that perch was broken up into these 18, 20 inch pieces. Like the whole thing has been smashed to bits, like to prevent their, uh, like, you know, as a parent, you know, hey, don't do this. Don't leave this area to your kid. And they, they push that boundary, they do anyways. And this creature, I'm just speculating, you know, it's like, hey, mama, you know, hey, I, I, I saw those hairless apes and where were you? I was sitting over here where we watched, you know, the farmer drive in and out and went and destroyed that so that they won't sit there. But actually, there's I found another one and it's a bigger log. And actually, I speculate an adult sits there. I found another one right in the same area and I didn't get close to it because uh, I don't want to spook them off to it. If I have an opportunity to come back with somebody that's serious about this DNA, because you know what, I've collected a ton of it. Where do you send it? I, I've, I've reached out and emailed the one, the likely suspects. I get nothing back. It's, it's honestly, a lot of this has been very disheartening to, to have this, you know this really neat spot and you can't gain anybody's attention and uh, i'm not gonna throw anybody under the bus because i bet you that they probably get blasted with people all the time and and, and you doing the podcast i have no idea what the backside work is but i'm positive there's a lot so and everybody gets blasted with email these days like crazy so i fall between the cracks but i've tried some personal in-person stuff and I haven't really gone anywhere with it. Been so that's honestly slowed my research because there's more that's happening down there. And I got the nest that I found. And I've been back into that a couple of times by myself. But come on, man. I somebody comes into my house or into my kids' room. <laughs> so I'm I'm a little skittish of going in there by myself. And Brian, back to the things of behavior that uh, I like to study is this nest. Wow. And I would really like to be able to talk to more people that have more knowledge regarding the nest. Um, number one, that it's so close. So I have a hard time calling it a nest. I, I uh, For my reasons and knowledge, I'm more comfortable calling it a bed and that, uh, I speculate that this immediate spot is a temporary babysitting area uh, while the adults do a hunt, wait for a hunt, or whatever is necessary. Um, I had remembered a, a story that the farmer earlier had told me, because uh, I'll ask him, is there any strange activity? And, and last November, as he was posting this one property line, he said out of one of these tree falls, he's like, it wasn't a wolf, it wasn't a cougar, he says, but it had shoulders and there wasn't a head on it. Well, this is less than 100 yards from where he had that, but this one was a different color and it was only like six, seven months difference in time. This one from his description, kind of more like that, that multicolor of like a coyote. Or, or a wolf and 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 that goes with you know some of the hair that that i have you know there's so i went back to do some more try some more scrapings of a different a different way off of this perch and this 
force is really interesting there. And I'll tell you later, what really blew my mind was ironically this, this, I wish I could remember the documentary on apes and they're, you know, building ground nests and stuff. It looked just like this place in Africa. Now, granted, the leaves of the trees were different, but the point is the very tall timber, you know, good 18, 24 inch diameter trees, nice and straight without any scaffold. So a predator can't come up it. And then, you know, one could squirt, shimmy right up that thing and be up in that foliage. And well, I could walk right under it and have no idea it's there. So there, there is a hiding way. Um, was the ferns. And I'll tell you, people already know to, to, to follow the creeks, look in the north, uh, excuse me, the west sides of the valley um, and check north south valleys. And people already know wherever the fish are. There's something with those ferns. And I speculate what it is after being in there, what I found with these mature ferns. I can, in this forest, I can see a fair amount of way. However, after it's logging, and actually, I think the logging helped make this area beneficial to the Bigfoot, is there would be a bunch of uh, saplings that now have light canopy that grow up and really dense, like, uh, like where this creature ran into, this juvenile, we didn't go and investigate this one area where I lost sight because it is simply so thick to walk into it that sometimes I can't part the saplings enough to even stick my boot in between it's just really dense and so it'll be like uh 20 30 foot dense pocket like that then it would be the forest would be open but it would have the ferns and the ferns would be about three feet high you could stand there and, and you could just drop to your knees you disappear you could actually crawl along on your belly in those ferns and probably not move any of those ferns and all of a sudden pop your head up to look around. I've seen turkeys do that, you know, right along a little bit of undulation and you catch that periscope up, boop, back down, you know, and I think that's what they do there. And that's why it's kind of safe. So one time when I was back there investigating the nest, I heard the Cummings engine coming. It's like, oh, good, the farmer's coming up. Because uh, I, this is, uh, I wanted somebody to help document as I uh, walk into this vest and collect samples and stuff into it I, and, and to check myself and to, and to help make sure that my, my, I'm producing good samples that I haven't done something. So I wanted somebody to hold a camera in there. So I, I go out to the road and I wait and I wait and I wait, what the heck? And now finally, the farmer's son, which I think he's probably pushing 800 horse out of his Cummings. Let me trust you, when he comes up that hill, you know, he's slideways all the way. I'm exaggerating, but point is he doesn't come up slow. I was astonished at how long it took for him to show up. Well, to come to find out, this spot offered this unique acoustic anomaly. And if you've studied the history and military, that's changed battle like Gettysburg. There was a, that happened big time in the acoustic anomaly on the backside of Little Round Top. They never heard a shot fired. Well, this is opposite of that because the, his driveway, they, you know, makes some switchbacks and follows a couple different ravines coming up. The sound of that Cummings engine, it, that sound just, echoed right up again giving them forewarning besides that other visual locations it would give that juvenile or that mother whomever was using that bed uh aside from the the benefit of visual but i mean increased auditory prior warning that somebody's coming and i think honestly sometimes they would go to that sitting position and and i have found multiple one of these sentry positions or, or slash entertainment positions they're just like sniper positions so like where this this uh perches you actually pass it a little bit so even even for you to be able to see them pulling that limb down if you're looking out the truck window you actually have to go slightly look back a little bit 
So now there was uh, speaking militarily, if you were to fire, you would actually be firing with them passing, or if you're shooting an arrow out of the tree stand, you're slightly quartering away as opposed to a perfect perpendicular situation. So to me, that's extremely smart that maybe they see from different positions, but if they know you're traveling up the road, they sit this way. So they're actually peeking at you just after you pass the perfect pick perpendicular which is extremely clever. So there's the sound advantage in there and those other ones. Uh, so going in to collect more potential DNA off the perch and there's these additional thick, thick stands of, uh, of it's primarily beech nut. Um, I took a wrong turn and Plus, I'm being trying to be hyper aware of anything from a distance. I, I took a wrong turn and I accidentally went into the wrong stand. And that's where I discovered this nest. And did you see the, the picture of it? I did, actually. I, I plan on doing a some sort of a blog post and incorporating that into the blog post over on Patreon for the Patreon members. Because I found yeah. it extremely interesting, man. And I... I don't know if you've reached out to anybody at the Olympic Project. They would be the one. I have. Who, who, and and it kind of has turned out like a lot of other stuff. Uh, speed of life for everybody. I reached out to Shane, Facebook Messenger, and he kindly got back. Uh, he was real busy. He'd get back to me. Um, and I, I've reached out again. And he, I know he's, he's busy. Plus, you know. Everybody works full time too in this big foot world. It doesn't doesn't make a paycheck. People say there's money in it. The money I have spent, if I was married, my head would be on a stake in my front yard for all husbands to see. <laughs> but I'm not married, and 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 it's my choice, you know, of, of my hobby. It's an expensive hobby, and. Um, yes, I, I've reached out and I am fascinated with this nest. And I still have trouble calling it nest uh, with bed, but there's things within it. But uh, I've also observed a few other things there that uh, of, I think show some of their behavior of how they hide, how they observe us, how to get out of the weather. Um, there's that maple sugar house, the abandoned one. They use that. I got a casting out of that. Uh, and I found outside of that, within within side of that, I found almost uh, uh, a bed like this. Not not worn as nice, but again, every single one of them is so much closer to us to the road that it blows my mind. That's why I have a hard time. That I, I, I don't no way do I think they're rearing their young in it. I think that they are trying to keep track of us so that they can do their job otherwise uh well, i absolutely believe that they they they're organized and they communicate and and it's 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 how they survive and flourish is you know it's teamwork um but what i've observed in this bed and, and and i didn't see all of it right away i did notice some of it right away was just so many uh tools of opportunity oh i forgot so i've i believe i've lost the one over opportunity on any dna from this nest because you, 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 it's organic you know I, i'm not a lab i don't have nitrogen to store the stuff in so uh very very carefully everything's been labeled transferred in down below sort of this providence but within these and i've broken them up and i'm thrilled to share with the right people but you can see in this video and this goes back to my um archaeology i find a lot of uh, uh archaic tools uh, i think i built my 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 business on a, a camp and because of the glacier uh, you know that's another story but anyways i've grown knowledge in that so in this one 
I don't know if you can see that. It's contents of the bed, but do you, can you see that stick that is uh, probably six, eight inches long, maybe a half inch wide? Yep. There's a bunch of these sticks in there, and I would notice those sticks, each end or one end would be dirty, and they were also like the same size. And then a lot of them were like a Y, a branch, of which uh, I have videotaped me collecting this. I actually didn't realize it at first, ended up using one of those tools to help gather this stuff up. And I think that's precisely what they're doing with it. So this nest bed, I'll tell you, it does, it does look like just this, this big little comfy bird's nest, you know, with this. The, the rim is organized with all sorts of those. And then right in the middle, um, just, just laying around, similar size. And, and we, we know that chimps, apes use it and uh, they don't classify as, I don't think they classify as tool use, but just tools of opportunity, you know, um, just a, a basic thing. And, and this isn't the only one in my sample, but this is the nested exist of two trash bags collected very carefully and plus multiple ones of these. Um, uh, there's, there is more of them. Um, but were these these tools of opportunity, which I think somebody way smarter than me might tell them behavior, and they might even notice more things. But uh, the first thing that I noticed, besides the large fecal matter, which uh, interesting point of note is the there's two different sizes of scat. Um, scat, I would say, one would be from a smaller one, and obviously one from a large one. Um, and I have photos of it, pictures of scale. Now I, I, you know, didn't put a ruler down, but I do know that that pocket knife seven and a quarter inches long, you know, and, and I, I guess I've finally, I've arrived in the Bigfoot world because I have Bigfoot poop in my freezer <laughs> and there's some special brownies in there too. And I'm not sure which is which. So somebody's going to be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> you know you've arrived in the Bigfoot world when you've got Bigfoot poop in your freezer. Yes, yes. But, you know, I did collect the two different sizes. I, I, I had to, you know, and I would I would assume that if if it was bare, and, and honestly, the first thing I went to when I saw all this was bare, other than some differences, um, was we all know bear is crap in the woods. And they don't care where they crap. This, they did their business. All of it was uh, the southeast. Nah, we're just going to call it the southern radius outside the bed, like one step outside the bed. And they did their business in the same area. I've noticed that too. I've, I've seen stuff. Well, you know, I didn't taste it. I don't know it's the, it's, you know, Bigfoot scat, but stuff that I've speculated, I've seen where it looks like they've gone at the same place. Now, mind you, there are bear there. In fact, this area, PA in New York, big bear. Uh, the record, uh, just a few miles, by the way, the crow flies, they hit one with the car, was 700 pounds. But I mean, they're harvesting six, 700 pounders all the time, but the record was broke. Um, maybe 20 nautical miles away, 835 pounds. That's grizzly bear size. Um, I've seen bear tracks there. Uh, I know there are some, um, but it, I just don't believe so because of this bed for, the, for these reasons, the, the, the two different sizes and types of the scat, where they're located, those, that, that organized rim of opportunity of like tools. You know, if you were laying down hide now and you were in like a recon or sniper position, you're gonna keep everything, you're gonna keep your profile low and everything right in with your quick reach. Then what was stunning to me was the pretty fresh picked ferns, they're placed in the center of the bed that were slept on that night. While I was staying right there, you know, that, that, yeah. <laughs> looking back, but obviously there's, 
there's enough trust to have their juvenile or whatever. So mind you, this, uh, when I found this, this is um, in July. My sighting was Memorial Day. So where I found this nest is so close to where my sighting was and that perch that I, I meant to go to where the perch was. I accidentally poked into this. So it, incidentally, when I lost sight of where that juvenile was running obliquely away from me or where I lost the view of it, this is where it was headed to, into, um, of which I observed through the, um, the uh, ferns was another direct trail over to where that perch was. But, you know, just like your woods there, the leaf litter and stuff just is not conducive. You can tell something walked through here and you can typically tell a concentrated, highly used uh, deer path will muck up an area it's about a boot width. And, and I judge it, and I have to do a lot of calibrate, uh, cal, uh, calibrating of what deer pressure is for people because they, they seek me out for it. And I have to come up with various types of levels of solution for them because they're covering so much acreage that pretty much I've observed over the years that if it's like uh, two boots together wide, that is super heavy. I have found trails through like tunnels in a sense, but it's packed down, leaving no obvious tracks but it, it's, it's close to a couple feet wide. It's not deer. deer. Deer will muck that up, you know, and it's, it's clearly identifiable. So in observing this recently slept on ferns, you know, again, I, I watch a, a, a documentary. I'm always, you know, searching something on eight chimpanzees ground nest behavior because they do some different ones. And gosh darn it, they, there was one that they had with, uh, they had hidden a camera and a tortoise. And this was with chimpanzees. And, and the chimpanzee was checking out, was kind of funny because they were trying to capture natural behavior of them. So now the thing's getting ready to go to bed. It picks ferns, lays them down right before it lays on it. It looks at that tortoise, takes that tortoise shell, they had the camera in it, lays down on the ferns, and uses the tortoise shell as a pillow. So what I'm looking at here with these ferns and where it lines up, there's a hemlock tree. And just the way that the root comes off, it's moss covered. It makes a perfect pillow if you line up how you were laying there. And gosh, if I had shoulders that wide, and I know about neck pain, um, I've, I've broken it twice. It's actually a pretty good story the first time how I did it. <laughs> but anyways, um, got run up a tree by some uh, Russian boar, some wild Russian boar. And uh, except the limbs weren't big enough and like Scooby-Doo, I got too high. And it's up there a while waiting for somebody to come with a gun and to give me a hand. It's getting dark and that branch broke and it flipped me over. And yeah, I, I came down. And anyways, um, this is clearly something that's sleeping on these ferns, freshly picked, which fascinates me that even, even why, why do gorillas pick a fern? Either way, they're sleeping on dirt, you know? What does, what does that offer? Does it keep bugs away or something that, you know, ants from crawling on them or something while they sleep? So this is exhibited the exact similar primate behavior. And I find that fascinating. So, you know, I did my due diligence. I have uh, photographs and video of me collecting this. Now, mind you, that was, again, a situation where you could cut with a knife. We did not feel like we were alone. And, you know, and you know, I'd wrangled the farmer's son, you know, and I ran into him on the road. It's like, hey, come on over. Give me, you got to see this and give me a hand with this. And, um, and don't go back here again, you know, <laughs> I, I would, well, I would, <laughs> but <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so he actually did a great job documenting, trying to, cause it's hot, it's humid. I got a couple cuts on me from the brush coming in, keeping an eye on, make sure I'm not uh, hovering over stuff because yeah, I got a mask on, I got gloves, but I'm also trying to sanitize and everything in between. And he knew what his job was for me, did a great job. And I didn't want to collect it all up together in case I did accidentally 
uh, contaminate it somehow. I was making several attempts into this. And I'll tell you, as soon as you, well, that, that one with the, the stick that I showed you, did you happen to see any hair hanging off of it? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the, what's remaining of the organic matter. Now, now, Brian, you can tell the audience how I'm not looking in this, breathing in it, but you can generally see the hair just hanging right off of it. And this thing is littered with hair. And why wouldn't it be? You know what I mean? If they're sleeping there. And again, uh, if, it, if it's a bear, it's got to be a new breed because it is extremely freaking long hair. It, 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 it uh, meets all the suspect features of it. And, and yes, I have a, a microscope, as you can see there. And I've long suspected, uh, theorized that there's something with the UV light with them and their abilities. Um, actually, uh, part of this therapy I had to do from the injury, I, I would have to wear these different filters. And when I wore the UV blue and I would look out my backyard, anything man-made jumped out like the birdhouse. I mean, it, it like glowed and it's like, this is one reason how they're seeing. Maybe that doesn't answer everything with trail cams, but I did observe with that filter. So maybe they got a special skill and we all know that flying squirrels, caribou, caribou and such seeing that, but maybe it lets them see each other and it's how they help triangulate. And if they can't see, that's why they're making auditory signals. Um, it's just obviously speculation. But anyways, back to the nest. Um, it's just, it's really, it, I mean, there's the pillow. Oh, and yeah, yeah, the moss. Sure enough, you take a closer look at the moss. Yeah, there's long black hair on it. And I, I, I slid that moss off and I, I have that moss intact with the hair. Uh, and I, I, I am looking to share this with the right people to do the right things with it. Um, well, hopefully somebody, I've already, may, somebody may hear this on the show and reach out to me and I can certainly put them in contact yeah. with you, Todd, yep. and, and maybe get some of that stuff looked at for sure. It's fascinating stuff, man. It sounds like we could probably do another episode on just the nest itself, but I, we could. I, certainly, I certainly appreciate you coming on and sharing your experiences and anybody who wants to take a look at the, the photos and, and the evidence, they can join us over on Patreon and I'll have that posted over there as well, man. I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your stuff today. Absolutely. And I would, I'm, I'm looking for help with this project and, and so people can contact me on, on Facebook. So, you know, with, with my name on Facebook, uh, I've kind of coined this, uh, the Genesee Bigfoot project. So Genesee spelled just like Tennessee, but with a G. And since this is near the headwaters of the Genesee river, um, and this is kind of a project because uh, I'm focusing on this one area and I think it makes sense to focus on this so I can be reached through there. And, you know, I, uh, at my age and what I know that I know, I, I'm willing to give my name plus my last name is Smith. So there's a bunch of me, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, Todd Smith. Um, and you can put in uh, Genesee Bigfoot project or, or, It'd be hard to find Todd Smith because there's there's a bunch of us. Um, but yeah, reach out to me. And if you're in the, the Rochester, New York area um, and with experience and the right kind of people, I'm I'm looking for help uh, to partner with other people. I'm not trying to keep anything myself. Um, I am very protective of this property and this land for the, the kind landowners. I mean, it's just integrity, man, is everything everything that's what it's all about i'll definitely link to the genesee bigfoot project on the show notes for this so you guys can click on it and check it out todd thanks again for coming on man i really enjoy talking to you. hey thanks for having me all right i look forward to talking to you some more absolutely i've got another interview in like seven minutes so i had to cut that all right <laughs> all right so, um, it sounds sounds good but yeah i think I'll definitely, I'm sure somebody will reach out just about every episode I put out. Somebody reaches out and has questions about the person that's on. And certainly people are going to be 
fascinated with the nest part of that so i'm sure that we'll probably get some folks reaching out and maybe i'll even try to reach out to shane and uh, yeah because i would like to do some notes comparison and i i've tried to document as much i'm willing to share with them because i'm sure that they're better organized with 